Hi, my name is Amy Asandra and I'm a first year radiology resident at UCLA. I'll be giving a quick introduction to lines and tubes in pediatric radiology. First, I'd like to thank Dr. Susie Muir for making this podcast possible and also Dr. Ines Bochat for some of the diagrams we'll be going over today. So first we'll discuss UVCs and UACs and this is a diagram that I like that just shows the expected course of the UVC and the UAC. In more detail, the UAC comes down the umbilical artery, takes a characteristic turn up the iliac artery, and terminates in the aorta. So in this image here, we can see that this is the UAC because it takes that sort of characteristic turn and comes up here in the aorta. Since lines can cause thrombosis, the end position is where you don't want to compromise aortic branches. So there are two types of arterial lines. There's a low line that ends at L3 or L4, somewhere down here, or there can be a high line, which will end from T7 to T12. So one way that you can remember that is T7 is heaven, T8 is great, and T9 is fine. It's kind of cheesy, but maybe it'll help you remember where the UAC should be. Here is an older picture, but I think this is a really great diagram as well because you can see the characteristic turn on this AP view. And then on the lateral view that you can see that the UAC takes a more posterior course than the UVC. And this is a low line. So now we'll talk a little bit about some malpositions of U UACs. You can see that this UAC comes all the way up and takes a turn into the patent ductus arteriosus here. This is another example of a UAC that's come a little bit too high. So here we can see it coming up the aorta and it ends actually in the left common carotid artery here in the neck. Here's the lateral view. Now to talk a little bit about UVCs. UVCs take a more anterior course in the body and you can see it coming in through the umbilical vein. It comes up to the portal sinus or the junction of the left and right portal veins and then goes into the ductus venosus here, goes through a hepatic vein and then into the IVC. And it should terminate somewhere around the level of the diaphragm at the junction of the IVC and the right atrium. This one's a little bit too high, it terminates in the right atrium. So here we can see it coming in through the umbilical vein, up towards the liver, towards the portal sinus, into the ductus venosus here, into a hepatic vein, and then up into the IVC, and then into the right atrium. So the ductus venosus closes around four days to become the ligamentum venosum. So you know that if an umbilical line has been placed, it has to be before that time. Afterwards, you'll start seeing picks placed and other peripheral lines. So here again on the lateral view, you see the UVC coming in, taking a more anterior course, coming to the portal sinus, going through the ductus venosus, and then terminating here in the right atrium. So it takes a more anterior course. Again, the UAC takes a more posterior course, and you can see that characteristic turn there in the iliac. So I'd like to point out that if you see the UAC or the UVC advancing, it's not necessarily that the clinician has advanced the line. As the umbilical stump shrivels, it can change the position of the catheter. I was also wondering that every time you see a line advancing, whether they just push it forward or whether they have to replace the line, because I thought that that would introduce bacteria from the skin into the body. But I spoke to some of the residents and they said that it's okay just to push the line in. And so they do actually advance those lines. So here's another example of a UVC that's gone a little bit too far. Here you can see it in the right atrium here. This is another good example of a malpositioned UVC. So here we see it coming in, and this is actually a patient with an abdominal wall defect. So the bowel is outside of the abdomen. This is a silo. So what the surgeons do is instead of stuffing the bowel back into the abdomen when it clearly won't fit and they can't close it, they hang it from the silo and gravity pulls the bowel back in slowly. So there's an abdominal wall defect here, and the UVC comes in and actually goes into the splenic vein. So here we see it cursing towards the spleen. This is an example of a UVC in the portal vein. Instead of going to the left like we saw before coursing to the spleen, we see it coming towards the right here into the portal vein. And it doesn't take that turn into the ductus venosus. So this is another example of a UVC that's malpositioned. Instead of coming up into the ductus venosus and then towards the right atrium here, we see it coursing downwards instead into the SMV. 
Another complication that can happen when UVCs are placed is that they can perforate the liver parenchyma. So here we can see a little lucency here where air has been introduced and an abscess actually formed in this patient where this tube went through and perforated the liver parenchyma. So now we're going to talk a little bit about picks, and there can be upper extremity picks, as you know, but there can also be lower extremity picks. So if you see an infradiaphragmatic catheter, which you may think is a femoral line, and a lot of times the uh, bottom of the film is cut off and you can't really tell, just keep in mind that it could be a lower extremity pick placed via the posterior tibia vein as well. So this is an example of a malpositioned pick. We can see it coursing here into the azagus. Here you can see the pick coming in nicely from the upper extremity, the left upper extremity, but it terminates short here. The expected course of the pick should go from an upper extremity vein into the axillary vein, and then into the subclavian, into the left brachiocephalic, and then it should course into the SVC to the atrial cable junction and terminate somewhere around here. But here it's terminating way too high. Aside from picks, there are other types of peripheral lines like axillary lines that can be placed and also subclavian lines. Subclavian lines will course under the clavicle, whereas IJs will come down from the neck. And oftentimes it's a little bit hard to see because the neck in kids is so short, whether it is a IJ or um, a subclavian line coming in, but just keep in mind that the subclavian will go under the clavicle here. I also wanted to point out in this image that you should look at all the tubes and the proximal side port is a little bit high towards the GE junction, so this should be advanced just a little bit. So here is an example of a pick that goes too far into the right ventricle. So here's the right atrium and there's the right ventricle. I also wanted to point out that this oral gastric tube isn't coming down far enough, so it's either in the mid-esophagus or it could be in the trachea. There's the tip of the pick. So this pick is coming in from the right and it takes an interesting course. Instead of coming down towards the SVC right here, we see that it crosses the midline and it comes down. So this is a pick in a persistent left SVC. This is also a right extremity pick which goes down too far goes down the SVC here, comes through the right atrium, and actually goes into a hepatic vein. This is a pick in a right pulmonary artery via Glen shunt. So you can see that this patient has had surgery, and here are some embolization coils, sternotomy wires, and also a chest tube. So now I wanted to point out a few scary complications of lines. This line looks like it's going in the right direction, and it takes a little bit of an irregular course but on 3D imaging we can see that the line actually perforated the aorta and went through some of the great vessels. So that's one of the scary complications of lines. They can perforate the vessels that they should be in. Here's an example of a broken central venous line. Here it's okay. And then we can see that it broke off and actually coiled here, came up the main pulmonary artery and just sort of lodged right here. You can also see them more peripherally in the pulmonary arteries sometimes where they'll lodge more distally out in the lungs. Now we'll talk a little bit about endotracheal tubes. The proper position is below the clavicle, so you want it below the thoracic inlet, but above the crina so that both lungs are being ventilated. Examples of malpositions are main stem intubation, esophageal intubation, and you can also get tracheal perforation. So this is an example of a right main stem intubation, and you have a pacification of left hemithorax, which is not being ventilated well. There's the end of the tube right there. This is another example of a right main stem intubation, but this time with higher pressure. So you can see that cysts have formed within this lung, and then this entire hemithorax is again whited out. Here's a third example of a right main stem intubation, and I just wanted to point out that if this comes down low enough in the bronchus intermedius, you'll start to get atelectasis in the upper lobe, which is not well aerated. This lung, again, is not well aerated. Endotracheal tubes are not always benign. You can perforate the trachea and get a pneumomediastinum. So here we can see that the thymus is totally lifted off the heart. This is too lucent with air around the cardiomediastinal silhouette. So now we're going to talk a little bit about oral gastric tubes. And in this example, you can see that this one is too high, terminating at about the T2 vertebral level. 
So it could be that they didn't advance this far enough. It could be that the baby pulled this out a little bit. Or you should also think about esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal fistula. This is what a TEF looks like, status post repair, and you can see the clip here where they ligated the connection. Um, there's also a right chest tube, and here you can see an endotracheal tube, a UVC, and then also an OGT. So this is an example of an oral gastric tube in the esophagus, and I just wanted to point out here that the stomach and bowel are distended. Whenever you see the, this sort of distension, you should always check to see whether the tube that you have placed is in the proper position or not. This is an example of a weighted oral gastric tube. When you see this sort of tip, you know that it's weighted and they can just give this tube a little bit of slack and peristalsis will carry this down further. Here's an example of another weighted oral gastric tube, but this one has gone down the right main stem bronchus and further distally to lodge in the right lower lobe. Unfortunately, this patient was given some iron and has not done well since. So the iron actually went into the lung and that's not something that you want to happen. This is here as an example of a gastrostomy tube. You can see something that looks a little bit like a button with a tube coming out of it. So lastly, we'll be talking about other devices that you may see in pediatric radiology. First, we'll be talking about ECMO. ECMO is used as a last resort for respiratory failure. So the blood is taken out and oxygenated and put back in. Here are the ECMO tubes. And for arterial and venous access, the right common carotid and right IJ are sacrificed. Venous access is placed over the right atrium here, and blood is taken out and oxygenated. And then the blood returns via the right common carotid artery here over the aorta and is pumped out into the body. It's common to see that both lungs will be whited out here due to third spacing of fluid and also decreased ventilation. I also wanted to point out this dot here, which is an extension of this ECMO tube. Here's a portion of the tube that's not radio opaque, and this is actually where the tube ends. This patient had multiple pneumothoraces um, that were recurrent, so this patient has multiple chest tubes on each side. Patients on ECMO are anticoagulated so that their lines won't thrombose, so they're prone to hemorrhage. So these patients will also get daily ultrasounds of the head to make sure that they're not bleeding into the ventricles. Speaking of chest tubes, I just wanted to point out that you should make sure that they're in the right position. Here is an example of chest tubes which have terminated in the subcutaneous tissue. You can see air here around the chest tube and here around the chest tube. And here are the pneumothoraces which obviously have not gone away. Another type of line that you might see is a VP shunt. So like in adults, they come down and they should terminate somewhere in the abdomen. But this one goes too far. This one went through a patent process as vaginalis into the scrotum. This is an example of a biventricular assist device. So this helps the heart pump through both the right and the left ventricles. So this is an example of a left ventricular assist device. I wanted to point this out because they're not always biventricular. They can just assist one particular ventricle in pumping blood. Here are also epicardial pacer wires. This example is nice because it has a lot of different lines and tubes. Here is a right-sided internal jugular venous catheter. You can see it coming down from the neck. It has an endotracheal tube, sternotomy wires. This is a ductus ligation clip, which you'll often see. And then this is what epicardial pacer wires look like. They're these thin wires that overlie the heart. This patient also has a mediastinal drain coming up the center here. So again, we have epicardial pacer wires, sternotomy wires, a ductus clip, and an IJ. So I put this example in here because I always thought that pacers were placed in the left chest wall. But sometimes they can be placed in the abdomen too. This is an example of pacer wires that have been abandoned from a pacer that was placed in the abdominal wall instead of the left chest wall. Now this is quite easy, but I put this in here because I didn't know what it was when I first saw it, but these are external pacer pads. 
So these are external to the patient. The patient has also had a midline incision here, a horizontal one and a vertical one. These are overlying staples. And then some surgical sutures here. So that is the end of my talk on pediatric lines and tubes. You can find this podcast and others on pediatricimaging.wikispaces.com.